namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa when we are trying to understand the buddha's teaching one of the difficulties that we face is the inevitability of viewing the teachings through the lens of our own background, our cultural matrix. It's well known and is often stated that every time Buddhism expanded into a new country, it adapted to the forms in the new land and so we have from the original Indian form which already was diversifying greatly before it began to spread it went into uh, Central Asia East Asia Southeast Asia and to all these various countries it, it took on different coloration sometimes radically different as in the case of Tibet And now for the last, depending on where you want to put the beginning point, but at the longest, 150 years, but in a um, very significant way, only the last maybe 40, 50 years, Buddhism has been coming into Western countries, into the Americas and, and Europe. It's definitely one of the uh, features, I'm tempted to say flaws, of Western uh, cultures that we tend to be in a hurry. There's a uh, story I heard about a Japanese Zen master. Uh, he had a number of Western disciples, so he set up a branch somewhere in, in America. And he told the, uh, the students that, to begin with, don't try and change things, don't try and adapt, just practice in the, in the Japanese way and after some years he came uh, to America and visited this temple and they were doing that they were being very Japanese but they were finding it frustrating and one of the senior people there had a talk with him and said uh, we, we really would like to adapt and develop an American Zen and he said oh yeah that's actually that's a good idea he says uh, I think you should uh, develop your own American Zen, but uh, not just yet. It's too soon. Practice in a Japanese way for uh, just a little while until you're quite sure uh, that you have the the understanding of what's the essence and what's the, um, the, the the form that can be changed. You know, just keep going in Japanese way for a while. They kept trying to press him on what he meant by a, a while. And he said, oh, just a little while. And finally they got him to about a number and he said oh just two three hundred years that's all <laughs> <laughs> so in that regard looking at the buddhist teachings i think that one of the efforts that we should make when we're trying to understand the buddhist teaching is to try and see it through ancient indian eyes as far as possible to take it in its own terms, take into account who the Buddha was speaking to, what the situation was, and, and like that. I have been uh, working on this uh, project, a book review of, uh, I mentioned this in a recent talk that by um Indian Spanish Christian named Panikkar who has written a book about uh, Buddhism and Christianity. It's a very interesting book, and he's had some. One of his insights that I thought was very uh, profound was he said that one of the differences between India and the European tradition, and going back to Greece, is that on the Greek side, and going on into Christian theology, the problem was always 
the the physical world, material world, man is all that's taken for you know as given, and the problem is then understanding and justifying or or um, taking into account the absolute, whether it's God or however it's defined. Whereas in India, it was quite the reverse. The culture took as a given the absolute. And the intellectual problem was, given the transcendent perfection, how do you account for all this messy stuff around here? You know, the material world. You know, accounting for reality, which in uh, you know, so-called reality. Approach from the perspective of pure thought the material world, the universe, humanity, it seems very unlikely. Like, how come there's all this stuff and how come it's like this? Huh? So that's uh, a major difference of approach. And of course, in India, it was a very fertile ground for philosophical schools and religions and spiritual paths and debates. Indians... So still to this day, I think it's kind of a national character. They love debates. They love you know, getting in, getting in an argument. Yeah. Um, and certainly in ancient times, it was um, like a public entertainment to see uh, philosophers or spiritual people debating in the in the square. Uh, and in the Buddhist canon, there's a whole uh, book, the Katawatu, is a, like a debate manual that has very abstruse questions and nitpicky points that uh, were debated between the Buddhist schools and, and uh, uh, giving you the uh, formulas of the, the answers and the, the arguments and the counter-arguments. Of course, it's a Theravada book, so the Theravada always wins the argument. <laughs> So uh, one of the um, aspects of this is, of course, the various theories and ideas about the relationship of the absolute to the conditioned. And the Buddha's radical approach was silence. He didn't... uh, he, he refused to answer these purely metaphysical questions. Uh, origin of the universe, you know, for example. This is, uh, these are some of the things that um, make Buddhism in many ways the odd man out in, amongst religions because most of the major religions you know, define themselves by the, their idea of God and Buddhism doesn't really have a have a, a god, and very important part is of uh, most religions is a creation story. And Buddhism just says, "Well, don't worry about that. It's, it's not, you can't know that anyway, so it's not going to help you get liberated." Now, this sometimes happens when that uh, our Buddhist monks go to these interfaith meetings. You know, at some point there, you know, there are all these different like Christian priests and Jewish rabbis and Muslims and Hindus are all you know sitting around, and somebody suggests, well, why don't we start with a asylum prayer to God, however we understand Him? And the Buddha says, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> it's not going to work for me. <laughs> Got to be the troublemaker. <laughs> And it's not because Buddhism denies any any sense of real of a, a, a transcendental reality. It certainly doesn't fit. The Buddhism doesn't fit the materialist atheist paradigm either. And in fact, the Buddha was often defining his teaching as being the middle path between eternalism and annihilationism, between the theistic uh, view and the um, atheist view that uh, doesn't fit into either camp. And if we take the uh, 
the Buddhist teaching of not self. This is one teaching that I think has a strong difference in the way it's approached from East and West. I think the Westerners, when they first encounter the not-self teaching, the biggest problem they have in comprehending it is the ingrained sense of individuality that we have in Western culture. Um, And this definitely goes back to Greece, the idea of the individual as an autonomous unit. And this has been in many ways the greatest contribution in the world of thought that you know by Greece and the West and the whole idea of the human being as an as an independent entity and and free and and, and so forth and, you know so much has come out of that 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 has been goods you know social social good in terms of you know human rights and so on but in the intellectual level it's that's the kind of hurdle that we have to that we have to overcome from our cultural perspective but I think in the East, that's in India, I should since say the East, that's a bit too general, but you know, in India, the problem was not so much the, um, the question of the individual, because this was even before the Buddhist time, we had the Upanishads that was uh, uh, the teaching that the individual self is only an aspect of the greater self. You know, Atman equals Brahman. And so there was like a philosophical acceptance of, of sort of unity of, of beings. And the, the culture was not based on, the society was not based on the emphasis on the individual. It was, it's more families and tribes and so on. The problem in, in India, the difficulty, people, the hurdle people had in, in taking on the not-self view was more in terms of uh, substantiality. The question of, uh, uh, of what is real, what is the substance, the ground of things. And there were different Indian schools of thought that, that wrestled with this in different ways. And it's the idea of the three gunas and there's uh, um, the underlying, uh, what is it called in Sankhya? There's a Indian philosophy that has the idea of an underlying ground of all reality that manifests things or just kind of variations of it. And then the Buddha comes along and, and says it's all emptiness. There's no, there's no substantial ground. And uh, this is a way of thinking that, that's quite different from uh, anything that appeared in the West, at least until quite recently. The idea of substance and quality, which we find in Western thought from Aristotle at least onward, the idea that there are substances that are... uh, there's an essence of things, a, a substance, and it's modified by qualities that adhere to it. Whereas in Buddhism, there are qualities, but there's no substance. After the Buddhist time, in the um, period of when the Abhidhamma was being developed, uh, the underlying theory of of reality, of mundane reality, conditioned reality, was the the idea of dhammas. That there's an individual point instant of things. And other schools of Indian thought had a a similar approach, but with the important difference that they had something like this Aristotelian notion of essence and qualities. They talked about svabhava as the... um, essence of things, and that could be then modified by various qualities. Whereas in the uh, Abhidhamma commentaries, they make the uh, the emphasis on the idea that the Swabhava is the quality, there is no difference. So there isn't some thing that that becomes hot, there's only heat. And there's a multitude of these different things. So we understand the world 
in terms of process, so it's more like verbs than nouns. There's no reified substance. There's only contingent processes. So this is the, the radical idea of, of emptiness. This relates to the dependent origination, that nothing exists as a self-existent entity. There are no discrete entities. There are only relationships. There's only process. And we can analyze it as an abstraction. We can analyze things in terms of, of entities, but it, that's only a mental abstraction. It's not an expression of underlying reality. So there's quite a, a quite a different way of 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 thinking and of, of approaching things and trying to understand what is what is important, what what is the 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 underlying essence of the teachings, and we have to be careful. We don't read them through a, a filter of our own uh, preconceptions. Ajahn Tanisaro wrote a book a couple of years ago that's uh, called Buddhist Romanticism, where he discusses some of these, uh, these issues of, of uh, cultural uh, coloration. It's the way uh, Buddhism came into Western culture it was the first infusion of Buddhist thought into the West was in the first half of the 19th century uh, via the Germans, the German Romantics, and uh, Schopenhauer and, and uh, thinkers like that. They were the first ones to approach uh, Buddhism and they put their the coloration on it that still, still distorts a view of things today. And then I think every every generation after that, there's been similar sorts of things happening. It was the 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 Victorian British and in post Victorian as well that were the next big group to take it up with the uh, translations of the Polytech Society that until fairly recently were the only translations available were standard and they have their definitely have their problems they were the first you know they were, certainly did great work they were the pioneers of translating texts into into english they're sometimes difficult to read unnecessarily so i think because uh, i think the um, they had the idea they wanted to give it a gravitas so they kind of tried to imitate the uh, the language of the king james bible and you know so it's like very formal and a little bit archaic. Um, and then you, you have some peculiarities, like um, there was a, a couple. There was the Captain Rice Davies and his wife, Carolyn Rice Davies, who were both poly scholars. And he died before the First World War. And uh, it's kind of a tragic story. Her son uh, was... Um, a pilot in the First World War and was killed, and she never got over that. And she used to go to spiritualists to try and speak to him. So she became um, obsessed with the idea that the Buddha never taught not self because she wanted to have the, like the spirit of her son was still there someplace. And she uh, uh, she came out with some translations that quite distorted the. Um, the sense of the text. And the way it can be done is um, the word atta is in Pali has, as used as a noun, it's the uh, equivalent of the Sanskrit atman and has a philosophical meaning. It's the self, the soul, the spirit, the individuality. But it's also used as a pronoun as a reflexive pronoun, uh, 
And we have the, exactly the same thing in English. You have like self as a noun, but you could also have self as a part of a pronoun, as in like myself, yourself. Right? So she would translate a sentence like, I did it by myself. She could translate that as something like, with myself, this have I done. You know, capitalized self. So if you see, uh, you know, uh, distorts that um, that meaning. Then you get, you know, up closer to contemporary times, and uh, there is, on the one hand, a strong movement to get back to the original teachings, and that is, translations like Bhikkhu Bodhi's are superb and very a very important contribution. But there's, on the other hand, in other places, there's a tendency to want to read Buddhist teachings through a filter of modernity. And for one, there's a whole school of people who want to present what they think is a scientific or rational version of Buddhism and they take out rebirth and karma and so on which is you know very distorting and there's another not so it's maybe not such a distortion but it's it's a subtle distortion that that creeps in is that um, people want to read back into the Buddha modern ideas particularly like social justice kind of ideas and I saw this very much in the dispute a few years ago about the bhikkhuni ordination. And um, the more traditional Buddhists, and most, uh, pretty much all the monastic Buddhists, whatever debate there was, was around points of vinaya and trying to understand is the bhikkhuni ordination as it's being done, is it valid according to vinaya, does it fit with the texts, and you know, this was like the only question that mattered really to traditionalists, but there was a very large movement on the internet and in some of the Buddhist magazines of people outside of that circle who kind of took the attitude, well, it doesn't matter what the texts say, you know, this is only fair that women should have the same rights as men and we should, we have to make it work somehow. And this was like a, like a, a different point of valuation that comes from outside of the traditional Buddhist teaching. And certainly the Buddha's attitude was that all human beings, men and women, and all castes, this was also very important in, the, in Buddhist time, the attitude toward caste, that all castes and both genders have the potentiality of awakening. And that that's the only point that seem to be important to the to the Buddha and to his early followers like this is this is the point that matters and everything else is in a social convention and it, like on the question of caste when someone ordained in the Buddha's sangha their caste distinction was ignored and all castes were allowed in and then they they lost their caste designation when they became in the, the sangha they were just all treated the same but the Buddha never campaigned for the abolition of caste. The closest he came to it was disputing with a Brahmin. He, um, uh, the Brahmin wanted to make the point that caste was an inherent aspect of reality given by the Creator God at the origin of time, that human beings were divided by the original sacrifice of Prakriti, this is the being that sacrificed himself to create the world, and so this one version, another version, the actual versions in the Pali text is that Brahma created the different castes out of different parts of his body, that the um, Brahman sprung from his mouth, the warrior caste from his chest, and the merchant caste from his belly, and the laborers from his feet, and you know. The Buddha disputed that and actually ridiculed it. And he made the point, it's kind of an interesting point, he says that divisions of caste as we know them can't be primordial because 
uh, amongst the Ionas, meaning the Greeks, the Ionians, you know, the, the, amongst the Ionas, there are only two castes, slave and free. So that they have a different division. You know. But he didn't try and he didn't try and tell people, you know, that we should abolish caste, we should all be equal, everybody should have the same rights. He wasn't oriented that way, and it's and these kind of social questions were not a concern of his in in in, the, in that sense. He did um, have advice for you know, the wise ruling of a kingdom, and in one place he gave some advice about how a republic could manage itself. You know, these sort of practical questions he would approach sometimes, but it was definitely was not a major concern of his. So I think, uh, you know, these are different ways in which we we can impose our own reading onto the text. Even if, you know, we have a good, we're coming from a good place, and, and there's, and, Many many aspects of our culture are praiseworthy. We certainly in the Western culture since you know the Renaissance and the uh, Enlightenment, we've had some good ideas. You know we're doing some things right, but but we have to be careful that we're not distorting the Buddha's teaching by using that lens to look at things. You, know, tr- you try and understand the the teaching in its own nature and then um, you can adapt it to you know the adapt the outward form to fit from beginning with the um, the starting point of understanding the original teaching the essence of the teaching is a calico it's timeless that the the essence of the Four Noble Truths is something that never changes. And that human beings, human culture is has multiple variations, but they're all the ways of dealing with the same basic impulses. And that human beings have uh, suffering, and suffering is caused by desire. And uh, if you get into the, the psychological the more psychological uh, texts, like in the Abhidhamma, you can relate to them from your own experience when you look at it. And it's not—it's not like the ancient Indians were some odd species different than us. They're—they're they're, they're the same as us. And in fact, I've—I've uh, I've made the observation that if you, you know take the broad stroke brush of human cultures, we have a lot. Modern Western culture has a lot of similarities, points of contact with ancient India. India at the Buddha's time was um, uh, fluid in terms of belief systems, as ours is, and um, there was a lot of personal freedom of, of thought. You know, you weren't persecuted for having, you know, some belief or another. And it was a, it was a, a, a time of change a time of political change and uh, technological change, you know, driving social change. And it's it's kind of uh, similar to our present day in that the, the, the main technological changes that India was going through were in communications technology. Uh, writing and money, coin money, were uh, new things that were coming, that were impact in society and they're both essentially communications technologies and of course we're in the midst of a technological revolution primarily in terms of communications i also find when i when i read the stories in the suttas the the background stories to some of the suttas that the human characters often seem very recognizable that they're, they're just like people that uh, that we've we've met, you know, you can sometimes sometimes think, oh, I know that guy. You know? and this is, um, for example, there's one that that I really love. Is this uh, the Buddha gives a teaching, and um, it's a fairly fairly longish kind of teaching. And at one point, he makes um, 
a statement about uh, Washington, something like, I can't remember exactly what, what it was, but it was something like a metaphor about washing, washing away defilements as you would wash your body in the river. Something like that. And at the end of the talk, somebody in the audience jumps up and says, Venerable Sir, Venerable Sir, I'm so glad you spoke about uh, cleansing in the rivers. Now, which which river is the most <laughs> sacred and and uh, efficacious for washing? Is it the Ganges or the Nadi or the <laughs> Achiruwati? <laughs> totally missing the point. <laughs> And you know, I've had that guy at my talks. <laughs> oh. So there's this, you know, there's a commonality of, of, uh, of human, human commonality in all of, all of these variations. Um, well, the only point I'm trying to make is that we should be trying to take the teachings on their own on their own terms and not try as far as we can to not filter them through our own preconceptions. And then I think we get closer to what the Buddha was actually saying. Huh?